Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning in case we have someone from that part of the world. Um, I would like to welcome you back for, from a very, very short break and obviously cordially apologize to Sir Fenius on your, on your health. Uh, but we have a program to tackle and in that regard, I am responsible to hand over to the following session chair and panelists. And in this light, I would like to welcome uh, our colleague, uh, Nikki Handig from um, the University of Natural um, Sciences, Natural Resources and Life Sciences, the law school. Nikki is uh, joining us from Vienna and he will be the, be the chair of um, this session. Nikki, over to you and your panelists. Thank you very much, Oliver. And I am honored and happy to have the possibility to chair this next panel on our schedule, which is sustainable soil management and climate. And uh, we heard it quite a lot of times today in the times of multiple crises. The climate crisis is not always the first item on our agenda, although it may well be the one with the most severe long-term impacts. And to prevent and mitigate its consequences, uh, a key factor must be the sustainable management of our soils since soil and climate are inextricably intertwined. That is why I am very glad to welcome a distinguished expert to give us a soil physics perspective on sustainable soil management and climate. Her name is Christine Stump, and we here at the BOKU are very glad that since 2018, she is a full professor and head of the Institute of Soil Physics and Rural Water Management at the BOKU in Vienna, Austria. How did she get there? Well, at first she attained a PhD in hydrology at the University of Freiburg, Germany in 2007. Then she held various postdoc positions, first at the Helmholtz Center Munich in Germany, then at the University of California, Riverside, USA, and after that at the University of Saskatchewan, Canada. I hope I pronounced that uh, partly correct. Um, and after that, she returned to Munich uh, for a group leader position at said Helmholtz Center. Result of her busy scientific activity are about 100 publications in peer-reviewed journals and among others, various prestigious editorial positions. Her scientific expertise focuses on water flow and transport in soils and groundwater, on isotope and tracer hydrology, the feedback mechanisms of hydrological and biogeochemical processes, and the mathematical modeling of water flow and transport. Thank you for being here today, Professor Stump. The stream is yours. There, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to give a talk on a soil, soil physics perspective on the sustainable use of soils and water and how it's affected by climate. So first, I would like to thank all the co-authors who contributed to the scientific parts of this presentation. Giuseppe, Alba, Gunther, Reinhard, Marlene and Stefan. So climate impacts uh, soil and water resources and particularly extreme events do if we have too much water or too little water. And this can result in pluvial floods, erosion events by water or wind, um, too little water that is not available for the plants, or in general, it can affect the entire water balance and particularly also the soil water balance. Those extreme events are going to change in the future, and we do not really know how the processes will respond or do, if they get even more dynamic. Also, soil management can have a positive or also negative impact on the soil and water resources or can be even used to mitigate climate change effects. Those include nature-based solutions, tillage systems, irrigation, and erosion mitigation me measures. But for us as scientists, most important is uh, that we also develop methods to actually understand the impact of climate and soil management on the soil and water resources, which is fundamental to actually sustainable use them. I will give several examples from our research um, to investigate processes and impacts of climate and soil management. 
Before going to the rural areas, I would like to give one example from urban areas. And we heard already that we really need to um, reduce the surface ceiling by implementing green infrastructures in urban areas. And um, those low impact developments can help to manage the impact of climate change in urban areas. For example, by reducing um, the uh, retention or by increasing the retention of water and re reducing the peak flow of urban floods and so reducing urban floods, floods impact, in, in fact. Such low impact developments um, help to manage impacts of climate change in cities through infiltration of water, storage, retention, even reuse of water and providing water for evaporable transpiration, uh, which can also help energy savings in the city. And also when it comes about the water quality by filtration. So one example from our research shows that green roofs um, can re actually retain water and increase the water quality. So the retention um, is clear that we have uh, inflow of water and the outflow of water out of the system is it's much slower because water is used by the plants to grow uh, for evapotranspiration. So we can decrease the amount of water um, and has left less urban flooding. In addition, if we use uh, wastewater for irrigating such green roofs, we showed that uh, green roofs um, can help to reduce the load of nitrogen uh, in such systems and so a reduction of contaminants from domestic waste and a reuse of water actually in the cities. Let's move on to, to more rural areas and particularly look at the soil water balance. And, and we did a study within Austria to look at the climate gradient um, within Austria and how it affects the soil water balance. And particularly, we were interested to predict also future changes in the soil water balance. Um, we had access to a nationwide monitoring system operated by the ministry uh, in Austria where we set up soil physical models uh, for soil types with different uh, types um, and different climates. And um, we calculated um, the, sorry, the average groundwater recharge and we showed a west-east gradient in Austria with higher recharge rates in the western parts and lower recharge rates in the eastern parts. This is closely controlled um, by the amount of rainfall, as we have less rainfall in the eastern part and more in the wetter part. But the question is now, how does that continue in future? And we use those calibrated models and different climate change scenarios to look um, where in future there might be more or less water available. So we looked at the recharge groundwater recharge and the actual evapotranspiration for different climate change scenarios. And we found significant changes uh, for the more drier uh, projections um, that resulted in a decrease of groundwater recharge, mainly in the western parts of Austria. Interestingly, the evapotranspiration, so the actual evapotranspiration did not change much. So it's mainly precipitation controlled, and then there is a limit of water available for evapotranspiration. For the more wetter scenarios, we found significant increases of groundwater recharge, mainly in the drier west eastern parts. Um, but in, in general, we found an increase of recharge. However, when we compare uh, the total re groundwater recharge within the next decades, we see large differences between the individual scenarios. And those differences between the scenarios and uncertainties are much higher than the uncertainties we have from the soil physical model that we used, actually. So this means that in future, we need to reduce the uncertainties of such scenarios for uh, developing sustainable management strategies in advance and proactively. Water is one of the most important factor for soils and using um, soils for agricultural production. 
Due to the effects of climate change, crop water requirements are increasing, so do the irrigation requirements. And a study from the ministry showed that um, within the next years, um, there is um, a reduction, a decrease of available groundwater sources of up to 23%. And this is also essential when we look at the irrigation requirements in Austria, which are going to increase in the northeastern parts and the uh, southeastern parts in, in Austria. And here we really need to improve irrigation management um, to save water for agricultural production. Um, and for doing so in our research, uh, we are um, using the uh, methods to assess the plant water status um, by evaluating different irrigation strategies and adopting crop water stress indices also to subhumid um, areas um, for increasing the water productivity. At the same time, we also look at the soil water status and evaluate different irrigation strategies and adapt irrigation thresholds. So to not irrigate just um, uh, when the soil, uh, when the plant is in stress, but when the soil tells us that there is too little water. We tested also different irrigation systems and how efficient they are. So from drip irrigation to sprinkler and boom irrigation. And in addition, we at the same time looked also at the, at the water balance under different tillage systems. And here we used uh, tracer techniques and looked at the isotopic composition and the profile of the pore water, which gives us some information about the age of the water and when this water was infiltrating into the ground. And from those isotope depth profiles, we were able to calculate the water balance and to identify how much water is lost by evapotranspiration, which was up to 80 to 91%. And we found from the tillage options that no till, um, in no tillage systems, we had the least evapotranspiration and the potential highest contribution of water to groundwater recharge. In terms of irrigation, drip irrigation was the most efficient, where we observed the least loss of water to transpiration. If we now want to look, um, we also use this uh, method to split actually evapotranspiration and transpiration. And here, those isotope methods are the only possible to distinguish. And for, for management, the water loss to transpiration is very important. And we found uh, that there's more evapor evaporation uh, than actually expected but still transpiration is dominating the dominating process. We also here wanted to look at how tillage options impact those ratios and investigated this in a soybean field for conventional and no tillage system. And we found that no tillage has a higher biomass production and water use efficiency. However, um, this was mainly due to the fact that conventional tillage was water limited during the grain development phase and later during the observation period, there was enough rainwater that at the time when the um, crops were in the perfect um, maturity state. So the main factors here was not only related to tillage, which indeed gives a difference in the soil hydraulic properties, but the delayed plant development and direct ground cover uh, for no-till were also of important for the separation of transpiration and um, evaporation. I will now change the topic. Uh, the last part of my talk is about land degradation and soil erosion. Uh, caused by wind or water, which is one of the key challenges threatening the soil resilience. Most of our uh, soils are prone to erosion due to intensive land use. And we really, from a scientific perspective, need um, long-term studies on the plot field and basin scale to better understand those processes and develop targeted adaptation and mitigation measures. So within Austria, we have some long-term plots where we have been doing erosion measurements for um, over decades. And those long-term data at three different sites 
show, depending on the tillage system, conventional conservation, direct seeding, we find on average uh, the least surface runoff for direct seeding systems. However, this strongly depends on the soil type. In terms of water loss, it's very clear uh, that the direct seeding reduces the soil loss significantly. We not only work in Austria, but in different parts of the world where we um, assess the impact of stone bunds along the contours on surface runoff and erosion. And so, so st stone bunds reduce the overland flow velocity so that more water infiltrated into the ground and um, there was also a higher soil water content. By tracing um, the sediments along the field at the hill slope, we found that the sediment was deposited in the field and not along the uh, stone bands themselves, which is a good news. To mitigate or for yeah, develop mitigation strategies, um, it would be necessary to um, assess the erosion vulnerable areas on the catchment level and then start in those areas where we expect most of the soil loss and start with the mitigation measures there. With that, um, we also um, showed, uh, or we are in cooperation with many farmers and um, particularly with one of our EU projects where we um, develop um, soil restoration strategies. And here's one example also related to erosion where a farmer developed a technique for um, potato cross stem systems. And the PhD student Matthias concept showed uh, that the soil loss under conventional loan um, farming is very high and can be reduced by those um, cross stems up to 89 to 99 percent. Similarly, we are um, in, in discussion with farmers and disseminating the positive effects of winter hard greenings on soil health. And it's important to, to know that this is really a feedback loop and um, that soil restorating Strategies need to be tested and um, um, implemented, and uh, this needs to have a close contact between scientists and stakeholders. I want to summarize that climate change impacts the hydrological cycle and therefore also water and soil resources. We have different management options for mitigating negative impacts, but this strongly depends on the pressures, but also on the soil climate and available resources and many other points. To better um, be informed for the future, we need really long-term research infrastructures and innovative uh, methods to identify the processes and to cooperate with stakeholders for their implementation. So green roofs in urban areas can um, be used for water reuse and flood mitigation. The combined usage of plant and soil water status is required for an improved irrigation scheduling and to increase the water use efficiency. Soil cultivation and land cover options can improve the soil water status and reduce soil loss. And tracer methods are good for assessing the physical processes and influence of climate management options on water and soil resources. And uh, I really think that reduced uncertainties of climate scenario analysis is um, required for proactively developing sustainable soil and water management strategies. For some of the references, if you're interested, and uh, I thank you very much for the attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for those interesting insights, Professor Stump. Especially for me as a mere legal scientist, it's always very um, refreshing to hear views uh, from other disciplines. But before we pose our questions, um, and before I can ask mine, um, I would uh, recommend that we move on to our next speaker, uh, Herwig Ranner, who is someone I am also especially looking forward to hear from, because Herwig is a team leader and coordinator on climate issues at the Directorate General for Agriculture of the European Commission, and he is the EU Agriculture Negotiator at UNFCCC sessions since 2012. Herwig has a background in marine biology, biogeochemistry and clim climate sciences with degrees from the University of Vienna and the Free University of Brussels. He started at the European Commission in 2009 after beginning his career initially 
as a climate change researcher mediating between fishermen and environmental NGOs, assisting and then advising a member of the European Parliament and representing seaports, uh, all European seaports, as their environmental policy advisor. And on top of all that, uh, on top of his scientific training, uh, Herwig has a solid background as a mediator and negotiator in different professional environments, and he worked on the farm of his brother whenever he had the time learning about the daily issues and problems of our farmers. And I think that even after this brief introduction, it has become quite clear why Herwig Ranner is the ideal expert to tell us something about agriculture in the EU and climate change negotiations, the Coronivia joint work on agriculture. We are looking forward to your presentation whenever you are ready. Many thanks for this great introduction. Can you see my presentation now? We see, we see you and hear you loudly. And okay. So, uh, as you have said, uh, I've been doing this for quite a while now. So uh, I started to work on the climate negotiations in 2012 in Doha. So why are we doing this and why is the Commission uh, active in this area? Well, for once, we have the European Green Deal that uh, some of you must have heard about. We have different areas of activity, as you can see. For example, the farm to fork strategy that has been communicated to the public that is now going to be implemented. There's a review of the common agriculture policy that also has a 40% uh, of the budget targeted for climate and environmental issues and uh, many other areas. And as you can see, we also aim to be something like of a global leader when it comes to climate change and the environment. We also have a climate law that has been adopted. What does this law do? Uh, it basically says that we will reduce our emissions by 55% by 2030, which is quite ambitious. We will also set out a goal for 2040. This is just starting. And we want to be climate neutral by 2050. And as part of all these efforts, we also want to communicate what we do at an international level and work together with other countries to make sure that at the global level, we also achieve something. When I will talk about the negotiations, you will see there's quite a number of abbreviations um, that are used day to day by the negotiators, but might not be something that everybody has heard about. So I think the, the presentation will be uh, online afterwards for people to take a closer look. So you have a, a short explanation of these topics, like uh, the subsidiary body for scientific and technical advice, which is basically the the room for discussion where we work in. This is all part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So basically the Framework Convention has a plenary and the plenary is assisted by uh, so-called subsidiary bodies. Uh, there's one on science and technology and advice and another one, the SPI, which is the subsidiary body for implementation. You have heard of of the COP, the Conference of the Parties, which is basically this plenary session, the main uh, decision-making body under the convention, which is not the same as the Paris Agreement, but I, I can answer questions to that afterwards. And our topic is named after a research station in Fiji, because we, as you will hear, managed to agree uh, on a quite substantial decision during the presidency of Fiji, of the COP. Unfortunately for me, it was not held in Fiji, but in Bonn, so the weather was quite different. Um, so to tell you how it all started, so basically at COP17 in Durban, <clears throat> we had a, another landmark decision where the ministers uh, present at the meeting decided we have to do something about agriculture. So agriculture wasn't part of the climate negotiations before. So they agreed to have an agenda item on agriculture with a short description. And then they thought that parties would be yeah, fit enough to come up with ideas to fill this agenda item with life. 
it took a little bit longer than foreseen because uh, we had very hard talks. As I said, I started in 2012, so just one year after at COP18. Took us until 2017 to start to agree on what we actually want to do in this agenda item. The reason for that is because agriculture is a very important topic for many people. It's a lot about food security also. It's a lot about making sure that farmers get the right support when they change their practices and work more on climate. So finally at COP23 in Bonn, Fiji Bonn, uh, we agreed on a work program. And that was quite revolutionary because we said, okay, we give ourselves a limited amount of time two and a half, three years, where we will tackle different issues that we have agreed on. There will be workshops. Uh, we had experts coming telling us what is the, the state of knowledge. We looked into how can parties access money to get support for adaptation, mitigation, and all the issues we talk about. And uh, you will see in the next slide uh, a copy of this decision. But it also addresses how you work on soils, how you work on water management, uh, what do you do with livestock emissions, uh, what can you do to improve nutrient use. Also, how do you assess adaptation? And all that without endangering food security. So here you have a, a timeline where you see what we have been doing since 2018. You have the different topics of the Coronivia roadmap, which was basically then laying out exactly when we would do what, when certain workshops would happen, what do we do with the results. So for every workshop, uh, and you can click on the links that I put there, you will find a report. Uh, you will also find conclusions that have been adopted at every or each of the sessions. You see on the left side the uh, decision text that we agreed on. Some of you will say, why did it take eight years to agree on one page? Um, the reason is really that you are negotiating a list and many, many different parties have many different interests. And you, you need to agree on what to do in a group of 192 countries. So imagine if you go with your family to a restaurant and you have to agree on one single dish that everybody has to eat. So that's a bit uh, the comparison. But I think we managed to have a good mix because we have developed and developing countries that have also different issues and different interests. And we talked a lot about risk management and uh, soil management. What can we do, especially in countries that are on the southern hemisphere where you have totally different problems than you would have in the northern hemisphere. So lots of droughts and uh, yeah, totally changed rainfall patterns and so forth. And so we successfully finished all the workshops. We even had an additional one in 2022. And now that we have to go into the COP in Egypt, so COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, we will have to conclude and report back to the COP, to the main body of the negotiations, what we have achieved and what our recommendations are for future work on agriculture. What we have seen is that, at least as the EU, I can, we didn't have the negotiations yet, so I can't speak for everybody, but what I can say is that we have seen that we need to work on how do you implement measures on the ground? Where do the resources for this implementation come from? How can you make uh, information on how to access <clears throat> the different funds that exist at the UN level for parties? Uh, how can you make sure that everybody is aware of all funding opportunities that also might be outside the UN processes? So foundations like the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, and so forth. Uh, we saw that there's loads of knowledge, and we have to find a better way of how to 
exchange on that knowledge, exchange back best practices. We just have seen a, a presentation by my colleague before that shows already under the Horizon 2020 programs that the EU is financing, we are doing a lot and a lot of interesting stuff. And so we need to do uh, our recommendations in that vein so that we make sure that we uh, we can support uh, the countries that are members of the UNFCCC whenever they want to do something in agriculture. And uh, of course, the main goal of all this is that if everybody does a little bit, then we will maybe better manage to reduce our emissions globally. So only the EU with even if very ambitious goals on its own will not be able to solve our main problem with climate change. It's the only, uh, we have about 10% of the world's emissions, so other people will also have to do their part when, whenever they can and in the conditions that they have. So the, the link to the Paris Agreement, and by the way, under the Paris Agreement, you will not find the word agriculture. It was a very difficult decision, but you have a preamble on food production systems. But there was no agreement how to include anything uh, done on agriculture in the main Paris Agreement text, because, as I said before, many people are afraid of that we would do something that would endanger food security for many people. And you have parties that are more interested in adaptation and other parties that are more interested in mitigation activities. So it's quite complex and not, not so easy topic. And we will do our best in Jamil Sheikh to, uh, to get around that and already have a good conclusion of this Coronivia joint work and then have something useful to do for the next period. And that might involve for example, how to include parts of it with the work already happening under the Paris Agreement. I, have I been in my time or did I go too long? Just tell me. It's fine, really. We have, yeah. we have time left. So maybe I can add that uh, we are helped a great deal by the colleagues at the FAO, so the Food and Agriculture Organization. We also have good exchanges with the people at the World Bank. And the FAO will give scientific input, uh, will help to organize meetings also at the regional scale to make sure that everybody that goes to such a climate conference regarding this topic gets all the information needed, that we, uh, we have a good preparation. Colleagues from the World Bank are always there to uh, inform anybody who needs to know what kind of opportunities there are to get funding. Then, of course, when we, whenever we can, we try to invite scientists to get the, the latest on what happens on the ground, uh, what can we do to change practices. So the IPCC, uh, for example, also is always present at our meetings. We will have quite tough discussions in Sharm el Sheikh, but at least for the EU, we are very positive that we will come home with a, a good result for everybody. And we are certainly going there in a yeah very cooperative spirit and to to make sure that also what you are doing in your field as scientists uh, gets the right level of attention and helps whenever you uh, you put in place new projects that yeah work with people on the ground political decisions that are taken uh, taken on the basis of this science and that would also include any decision that we will take in Sharm el Sheikh and I think I can conclude there okay thank you very much Thank you for those uh, valuable insights, Herr yeah, Begranna. Um, while we listened to you, there was a lot going on in the chat already. Um, Professor Stump was uh, busy answering questions 
and maybe uh, we will start off with questions uh, for her and uh, because one of the uh, last keywords you said uh, Mr. Rana was uh, the um, scientific exchange and the good exchange of information. I think that was a direction that one of the questions in the chat was uh, aimed at from Mr. Kamara who said uh, thank you to uh, Professor Stumpf for her in-depth presentation backed up with scientific uh, data and then asked how do we build the capacity of scientists in developing countries, especially in Africa, to carry out such studies that inform policy intervention of sustainable soil management. Maybe, uh, Professor Stump, you can um, answer that in a bit more depth for everybody. Yeah. So, I mean, we have been working in collaboration uh, with colleagues from all over the world, also from Africa in studies, and this was always a very fruitful collaboration. And um, so bringing to get, uh, together different expertise and um, also having different resources. So very often PhD students then just come for some analysis in my lab and use our infrastructure or we we go down there and have a look at the sites and jointly discuss options. I think this needs to be strongly supported by international programs fostering such an exchange. And this include yeah, so therefore we need some funding uh, opportunities to, to really increase uh, this exchange in future. And um, also increase resources for building up uh, long-term um, study sites in some countries where we not only have projects for one half a year but really have the infrastructure to do observations for five ten years and that we can really study the impact of climate change on the processes and in science it's that we we often it's difficult to generalize processes um, not a certain tillage system is not bad everywhere, right? It strongly depends on the soil and the questions we have in mind. And therefore, we need such um, data from all over the world for different kind of climate, soils, and, and also cultural systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, right over to you. Thank you for the, the answer. I think um, I can only agree uh, from my point of view. And uh, over to Mr. Rana. A uh, question that was directed at me, and um, please feel free to. I see there are more questions even coming in now. Um, but, Mr. Rana, when we talk about the unique potential of agriculture in tackling climate change, um, what I mean, you, you painted the picture of the family sharing one meal, but uh, what would you identify as the main hurdles in terms of regulations or in terms of political interests for realizing that unique potential? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, the main reason why people are very careful when it comes to uh, yeah, do anything in agriculture to, that would have a, a link with mitigation is that they're always afraid that it would reduce yields. Uh, you have different uh, situations in the different parts of the world. Of course, the EU is very uh, food secure. Other parts of the world are not. And we also know that in agriculture, you cannot reduce down to zero because there's biological processes involved. And so there will always be some residual emissions and you have to offset them by, for example, storing more carbon in the soil, by uh, preserving forests, by carrying out uh, maybe technical solutions to store carbon with the bioenergy impacts and whatever the scientists will propose we should do. So it is always a national and at least a regional decision of what you do in the agriculture sector. And for example, because of traditional approaches and uh, how things have been for many, many years, it's also not so easy to tell farmers to totally change what they are doing. By definition, a farmer is conservative because they want to make sure that they have a yield at the end of the period. And if they change something radically, then there's a risk that they might not have this kind of yield. And they are not always the ones that earn the most money in an economy. So their risk is very high compared to other actors in the economy. And these are a little bit uh, the the reasons why why it's not so easy to implement changes and to to reduce emissions 
livestock is one of these examples. You have a lot of yeah political messages coming from all kinds of uh, parts of the society. What we should do on livestock? Can some people are arguing? Let's go vegan. Everybody, uh, livestock numbers should be reduced and so forth. It's not that simple. It depends which kind of livestock system you have, where you have it, what you do with your livestock. So, what are you producing? What is the feed coming in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. It's not something where you can have an easy solution with a, a single message approach. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's not that easy. Maybe it sums it up quite well, um, which is also true for what you said, uh, Professor Stump. Nevertheless, you said that um, improvements in irrigation management are needed in Austria. Um, my basic, but I think um, nevertheless essential question is, are they planned? Are they executed? And are there maybe role model states for those changes that we need and that we should plan for? Yeah, I mean, uh, in Austria, we are still lucky to have lots of water resources. and uh, But still, we should look ahead that particularly in the eastern parts, uh, and yeah, also this year we all faced a very dry summer and saw the groundwater levels are declining. Still, there are enough resources, but we should look ahead and, and save those resources also in terms of quality issues, not only quantity issues. So, and for sure, there are role models. There are member states doing irrigation practice already since many, many years, right? But they have a bit of a different way they they operate the systems and uh, regulations of water withdrawal and those are different and also yes um i mean we know very much about what to measure but this is uh, sometimes difficult um, um to have all the resources to improve the irrigation efficiency and um, under the given climate and uh, under the given soil and plant properties. And uh, so we are here working together with a farmer school uh, very close to Vienna, uh, where they operate already since 10 years, about 10 years, the same field practices. And we now uh, monitored over several years uh, these different management options in terms of irrigation practices, but also tillage practices, practices because both affects then the availability of water in the soil. Uh, but still, we here also we are learned from many countries like Israel or so that have uh, lots of experience in, in how to irrigate um, best. Very interesting. All right. Um, I see in the chat there are many, um, many people who are interested in uh, cooperations and reaching out. That's always good. That is uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we here have this conference to also bring people together and to share expertise. Um, but nevertheless, we have a, a tight time schedule. Uh, so I um, wa don't want to um, keep the moderators in the next panel for too long. Uh, so that's why I want to wrap it up and say a big thank you to Professor Christine Stump and to Mr. Havik uh, Rana. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, with that, I want to pass on the scepter back to you, Oliver and Harald. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah,